Venomous snakes make their prey suffer in two ways. Toxins may target the blood or the nervous system. They form clots, thin the blood, destroy muscles, and gradually paralyze the body from top to bottom. Some toxins can kill an elephant in a matter of hours. So why do people, knowing all this, feed live snakes to their camels? I'm not kidding! The habit of feeding live snakes to camels does exist in some Arab countries. It's not exactly a common practice, so there's very little information about it. Seems like snakes are necessary to treat hemorrhagic disease in camels, but what is this disease? How effective is this treatment in general? To get to the bottom of things, we need to look for the answer in the 7th century AD. Thankfully, we don't need a time machine. Isidore of Seville, known as the clerical encyclopedist, was a very prolific author. His key work, The Entomologies, features 20 books, in which Isidore tried to describe all things and phenomena that exist in the world. Of course, a lot of what's mentioned in the etymologies is slightly outdated after the 7th century AD, but I found one interesting fact. Isidore wrote, When deer are ill or weak, they draw snakes out of their holes with the breath of their nostrils and eat them. What for? This is their way to get healthy. It may sound almost absurd, it's quite hard to imagine a deer that can, um, blow a snake out of the ground? Or, on the contrary, suck it in like spaghetti. But the very fact of using snake venom for treatment is much stranger. It usually serves opposite purposes. Yes, folk medicine often uses very unlikely methods, but snake venom works. I'll make it clear right away. To achieve a desired effect, you need to be a professional, a scientist, or a deer. So you shouldn't grab a snake from under the nearest stone to relieve a runny nose. It is known that snake venom contains more than 20 different compounds, most of which are protein-based. Recent research suggests that snake venom can be used to fight adversary organisms. So far, the experiments have only been conducted in a lab. And as usual, there's not enough information, funding, and stakeholders. But it looks like snake venom could become a weapon against tropical pathogens like bacteria, parasites, and viruses. In theory, it could help treat tuberculosis, malaria, leishmaniasis, and Chagas disease. You just need to choose the right snake. The deer story doesn't seem so incredible anymore, does it? Like other animals, they also suffer from parasites, just like the camels I mentioned in the beginning of the video. In 2020, a large-scale study was carried out in Algeria, which found that the infection rate of gastrointestinal parasites in camels is 48%. Helminth infections, that is parasitic worms, were recorded at 23% plus parasitic protozoa. In short, this is a serious issue for animal husbandry practice, which needs to be somehow resolved. And people often use improvised means. Perhaps one day they stumbled across the snake and, in general, all this sounds pretty logical. But it's still better to seek help from a vet. Seriously, the likelihood of an animal dying from a snake it's trying to eat may be even higher than from some kind of condition caused by a parasite. However, camels have perfectly adapted to life in the harshest conditions. Yes, that includes snakes too. Camels have thick lips and an unusual mouth structure that allows them to eat food that doesn't exactly look like food, such as thorns. In addition, by resisting venom, camels have learned to produce more powerful antibodies than, for example, horses and sheep, let alone other animals. They just had to upgrade this skill to survive, and they nailed it. No wonder people came up with the idea to use this for their own purposes. Antivenom is made by injecting small amounts of a toxin into the animals and then collecting antibodies. It's quite simple. But do we really have to use camels to create a medicine? I have nothing against it, but there were no updates about these studies for quite some time. Maybe scientists should have focused on something simpler and more familiar. Aren't there any other ways people can create antivenoms? Of course there are. And they've been used for about 120 years. If there were no cure for venom, there would be much less people on Earth. Even today, venomous snake bites are responsible for 138,000 deaths every year around the world, plus serious injuries that you have to live with for the rest of your life. Imagine if there was no anti-venom, but the main issue is a patchy access to it. Depending on the snake bite, it can take between 1 and 20 vials of antivenom, and the cost is sometimes way too high. 
Depending on where you are in the world, a single vial can cost anything from $18 to $200 in sub-Saharan Africa to $17,000 in the U.S. But even in regions where the price seems reasonable for you, it can be huge for local residents. Imagine one dose of antivenom will cost you your annual wages, and you might need five of those? Many existing antivenoms need to be stored in a frozen state. Sounds logical? Quite. But in some regions of Africa, the electricity is too unstable, which means that that the antidote can't be stored properly. This contributes to its high cost, which is why in areas where they're most needed, meds are over and above the budget of doctors. Meanwhile, the antidote obtained with the help of camels can be stored even at high temperatures. Camels know how to endure heat for sure. In addition, they're so resistant to the snake venom, they can eat snakes even without human help. There's ample evidence that camels in India don't mind eating snakes when they have the chance. Many ungulates, such as cows, behave in a similar way. Deer do that too. They're considered herbivores, but that doesn't mean giving up on meat you came across by chance. Snakes, in particular, are a delicacy on their menu. Yes, you heard right. Cows do eat snakes. I was also surprised when I found out about this, but it turns out that cute cows do not mind eating even a live snake. Apparently, this happens if the cow lacks some substances like phosphorus. That is, for them, snakes are something like vitamins for people. So what? Animals create medicines without our help? It looks like it. Moreover, they learn to do it much earlier than humans. For example, sick chimpanzees ingest very bitter and really toxic plants, Vernonia amygdalenia, in the right dose. Enough to kill the parasites, but not hurt chimps themselves. Unlike primates, goats in West Africa have no idea how many plants they can safely eat and die from their toxins. Of course, the intelligence of the animals plays some role, but you couldn't just guess the right dose. There must have been some experiments or something like that. Wonder how many tests did the chimps run to find the right formula. Day 748. Continuing to test the cure for parasites. Seems like adding cinnamon was a mistake. Unlike animals, humans cheated a little. No, we're also conducting research, and many scientists have experimented on themselves in order to discover the cure, but some just knew where to look. For example, a healer from one of the Tongwe settlements once observed a sick porcupine eating the roots of a poisonous plant. When the porcupine recovered, the healer began experimenting with the root in small doses, first on himself, then on his fellow villagers. It turned out to be an effective treatment for dysentery, to which the Tongwe people still use up to this day. Over time, humanity has improved its skill of creating meds, learned to fight many diseases, removed parasites from organisms, and generally cleansed itself. Turns out this is not that good. Our victory is temporary. Medicine made our bodies too clean, which means that they now can be susceptible to the diseases kept away by useful symbiotic organisms. No venom, not you. The same thing could happen to domesticated animals. Being surrounded by human care, they became weaker than their wild kin. And that's not the only thing that happened. Because of too comfortable life without predators or the need to constantly think about where to get food, the brains of domestic animals have greatly reduced in size compared to the brains of their wild ancestors and relatives. One can say they've become dumber. And this is happening much faster than you think. Over just 200 years, cows have lost about 25% of their brain size. Why would they need to think when people take care of everything? Hi, Steve. Listen, can you help me with my physics research? I am Steve. If I were a farmer, I would be wary and even upset. What if some random predator decides to attack your livestock and none of the animals even senses its approach? After all, it's impossible to protect them all 24-7, but people would not be people if they had not figured out how to get out of this situation almost without paying a penny. They painted fake eyes on the cow's rear ends. I'm not kidding. Lions love to sneak up on their prey from behind, which is pretty smart. This way, they won't get noticed. If the lion realizes it's been spotted, it gives up and starts looking for other prey. Meanwhile, many creatures on the planet use fake eyes to confuse predators, though usually it's butterflies or fish, not cows who resort to such tricks, so people decided to help them. And it worked! Of the 683 cows with eyes painted on them, none were killed in the four-year period. Never expected this from the eyes on the backside. Mission failed. We'll get them next time. See you later.